this week on Warriors and Company. If you can sell yourself as someone who knows how Washington works, someone who has these relationships, someone who can get on the phone and get the President of the United States to pardon you know, your fugitive client, that's a very, very marketable commodity. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, Independent Production Fund, with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz, the Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation, the HKH Foundation, Barbara G. Fleischman, and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company. Welcome. I want to tell you about a book you simply have to read. I promise you will laugh and cry, and by the end, I think you'll be ready for the revolution. The title is This Town, an up-close look at how our nation's capital really works. I can tell you it's not a pretty picture, the story of a city's bipartisan lust for power, cash, and notoriety so overpowering that everyone and everything else gets sucked into its undertow. Government becomes no longer the servant of the people, but in the thrall of big money, lobbyists, and a media happy to live off its fancy leftovers in a feeding frenzy of gossip and shallow speculation. How appropriate that a capital built on a swamp has sunk so low into the stinking mud. Mark Leibovich is the chief national correspondent for the New York Times Magazine and is the author of This Town, which has everyone who's anyone in Washington talking and whispering. What a tale it is. Mark Leibovich is with me now. Welcome. Hi, Bill. It's good to be here. I've read your book twice. It's fun to read. It's eye-opening. I learned a lot from it. And yet, at the core of it, there's a tragic story. You see that? Absolutely. I, I didn't see it fully as I was writing it, but I see it in how people outside of Washington have reacted to it. The tragic story is that what has grown up in this city that was supposedly built on public service is this permanent feudal class of, of insiders, of people who are not term limited, of people who never leave and never die, figuratively never die, um, and who are there and who are doing very, very well for themselves, very, very well for Washington, and not very, very well for the United States. Can you frame the historical moment in which you're writing? I would frame it really over the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years, you've had this explosion of money in politics. Gold rush, you call it. It's a gold rush. People now come to Washington to get rich. Uh, that was never the defining ethic of the town, certainly 30 years ago. There is now so much money, it is now the wealthiest community in the United States. Uh, it is home to seven of the wealthiest 10 counties in the United States. And, and frankly, it is, I mean, power is obviously going to be very alluring. There's going to be some idealists. There's going to be the make a difference types. But ultimately, this has more in common with Silicon Valley, with Hollywood, than with Wall Street, which is a rush to cash in. It is a rush to somehow take from this big entity, this big marketplace, some kind of reward, as opposed to doing something that will reward the country. What's stunning is how disconnected Washington is, the political Washington that you write about from the lives of everyday people, is it because of this gold rush? When you look at the disconnect between Washington and the rest of the country, which people talk about, I mean, there's a shorthand, well, Washington is out of touch, right? People don't fully know what that is made of. I mean, I, I think you see intuitively on TV or when you visit Washington that people don't talk and deal with people the way most Americans talk and deal with each, each, with each other. I mean, there, there's a language, a language of obsequiousness, a language of selling, a language of spin. But, most, but look, it, it is a wealth culture. These are people who are doing very, very well. It's true in the demographics. It's true in the sensibility. The people you write about in here seem very comfortable with 
this town. They do. I mean, it's been very, very good for them. I mean, it's been, look, this town has worked for a lot of people, a lot of very good people, a lot of very bad people, and a lot of very mediocre people. Um, but these are, a, a lot of this book is, in, is, is filled with profiles of people who have made this town work for them. What do the readers out across the country tell you about the picture you have reported? Well, it's, the disconnect, it's, it's interesting, Bill, has been very much displayed in the reaction to the book. I mean, I think in Washington you have had a very carnival-like reaction to the book. It's like, oh, who wins? Who loses? What are the nuggets? Um, will Leibovich be cast out? Will he not be invited to lunch or to party X or Y again? So you have a, a very silly and shallow read inside the Beltway, which is titillating, I guess, in its, in its own way. Outside of Washington, you have a truer sense of the outrage. You have a sense of an education. You have a sense of, oh my goodness, I've known Washington has been something I've been disappointed in, but I didn't know it looked like this. I didn't know it had come to all of this, just this cont incredible contempt for what they are supposed to be there for, contempt for what their constituents are, i.e. us. You say political Washington is an inbred company town where party differences are easily subsumed by membership in the club, and you've talked about the club. The club swells for the night into the ultimate bubble world. They become part of a system that rewards, more than anything, self-perpetuation. Self-perpetuation is a key point in all of this. It is what you are going to, how you're going to continue. I mean, the original notion of the founders is that a president or a public servant would serve a term, a couple years, return to their communities, return to their farm. Now, the organizing principle of life in Washington is how are you going to keep it going, whether it's how you're going to stay in office, you know, by, by pleasing your leadership so that you get money by raising enough money so that you can get reelected, by getting a gig after you're done with Congress, after you're done in the White House, by getting the next gig. Mr. Smith goes to Washington and ain't. Mom. No, it isn't. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it isn't. And, and look, I tried to find a Mr. Smith character. I wanted to, and I, and I had some back and forth with the first publisher of this book, which is not the ultimate publisher of this book, about finding someone to root for. They wanted someone to feel good about. Um, to, to sort of run through the narrative. And there are people I think I could root for, there are people I like in Washington, I think people who are there for the right reasons, but I couldn't find him or her. And ultimately I gave up trying and I tried to sort of create a cumulative picture over a five year period. What, what does that say to you? I think ultimately it says that this is not, well first of all it's a very cautious culture I and mean, I think cowardice is rewarded at every step of the way. Ah, so. It's rewarded in Congress. You, you, everything about the congressional system, whether it's leadership, whether it's how money is raised, is going to reward cowardice. The true mavericks are going to be punished in some ways. If you, are going, if you want to build a career outside of office when you're done, when you're voted out, as a lobbyist, as a consultant, as many of them do, you are absolutely, in, you are absolutely encouraged to, to not anger too many people. Not I'll take a big stand not, then. Not take a big stand, right. No truth is going to be told here by, based on any sort of cowardly go-along, get-along way. Um, and I think that, that there are many ways in which the money, the, fine, the, the system is financed, the politics are financed the way the media works, that will not under any circumstances reward someone who takes a stand. As you and I both know, many Americans see Washington today as a polarized, dysfunctional uh, city, one that is not sufficiently bipartisan, but you describe it as a place that becomes a determinedly bipartisan team when there is money to be made. It is absolutely true. I mean, ultimately, the business of Washington relies on things not getting done, and this is a bipartisan imperative. If a tax reform bill passed tomorrow, if an immigration bill passed tomorrow, that's tens of billions of dollars in consulting, yeah. lobbying, messaging fees that are not going to be paid out. Let's take one example. Yeah. April 20th, 2010. The Deepwater Horizon oil rig explodes in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. 11 people killed. The largest marine spill in the history of the industry. Oil gushes onto the seafloor. 
or at least 84 days. You, Leibovitch, look at that crude oil flowing uh, into the Gulf and you see an equally large flow of cash spreading across Washington, covering our nation's capital to, quote, as you say, manage the crisis. Now, yeah. tell us how they set about to manage that crisis. So BP is in this whole heap of trouble, okay? They, they have this disaster that they are pegged with. Uh, the president looks powerless. I mean, what are you going to do? You have this, this awful calamity taking place. Systematically, BP is spending tens of millions of dollars to basically tie up the most, the most prominent Washington Democratic and Republican lobbyists, media consultants, ad people, to where you had an all-star roster. And all of a sudden, everyone is working together. I mean, you had rhetoric of President Obama you know, criticizing BP. You had BP saying, oh, no, we're going to make this right. You had Republicans saying, oh, the president should be doing more. So you had this TV sort of debate, the same noise you would see any other, in either, any other story, juxtaposed with these terrible oil-soaked pelican pictures from the Gulf, when in fact the city is just reaping this bounty. You say BP, British Petroleum, put together a Beltway Dream Team that included Republican super lobbyist Ken Duberstein, Democratic super lobbyist Tony Podesta, former Vice President Cheney's one-time spokeswoman Ann Womack Colton, Republican flags like John Fury and Democratic flags like Steve McMahon, and McMahon's business partner, the Republican media guru Alex Castellanos, who's a contributor to CNN. Yeah, McMahon's on MSNBC, and so it's very bipartisan that way too. And McMahon, the Democrat, and Castellanos, the Republican, are partners in a firm called Purple Strategy. BP hires them to spearhead this $50 million television campaign you talk about. To those affected in your families, I'm deeply sorry. They were brought, you say, into the fold by the Democratic uh, operative Hillary Rosen, who was working for a London-based firm that was also working for BP, and she was also a pundit for CNN. I mean, what a web. And again, I think the other piece of this is that a year later, Jeff Morrell, who was the head spokesman for the Pentagon under you know, President Obama's Pentagon, has become the chief um, Washington spokesman for BP. Former White House correspondent for ABC a News. ABC News. This one woman protest. He followed Bob Gates to the Pentagon, first with President Bush, then with President Obama. Sort of a classic um, revolving door figure, uh, Jeff is. But no, so that was, uh, I mean, it's a classic two step. I mean, I also think. BP has done very, very well rehabilitating itself. I mean, thanks largely to flooding the media with all kinds of um, goodies and a lot of advertising money, and we're supposed to feel good about BP again. Two years ago, the people of BP made a commitment to the Gulf, and every day since, we've worked hard to keep it. BP has paid over $23 billion to help people and businesses who were affected and to cover cleanup costs. Today, the beaches and Gulf are open for everyone to enjoy. And what's the moral that we, we draw from this story uh, uh, about this town? About this town is, well, well, first of all, when there's a problem, there is a lot of money to be made in this town. And look, it's another example of Washington doing very, very, very well. Let's look at Jack Quinn and Ed Gillespie. Jack Quinn is the White House counsel under Bill Clinton. He went on to cable a lot and defended the, the president during a lot of his campaign finance problems during his two terms. Met Ed Gillespie, who was then a Republican operative, in green rooms. They had this green room friendship. People become friends, and in Ed and Jack's case, they went into business together. They started Quinn Gillespie, the first real major sort of bipartisan lobbying firm. One-stop lobbying. One-stop lobbying. You, you want to deal with Republicans, you want to get to Republicans, you go here. You want to get to Democrats, you go here. Um, they founded them, they, their firms founded in 2000. Jack Quinn got into some trouble in 2001 after he successfully lobbied Bill Clinton to pardon his law client, Mark Rich. Fugitive. Fugitive, Mark Rich. It was a big to do then. Um, Jack was big time in the barrel. He's hauled before Congress. He's being, he feels like he's being looked at in restaurants. Um, and Ed, Gillespie said, look, Jack, in a few months, everyone's going to forget about this, and all they're going to remember about you and this incident is that you got something big done. And sure enough, uh, you know, Jack did a good job for his client. Uh, the outrage dissipated, and the, the, the firm, the lobbying firm, thrived with the rest of the industry. 
four years later, they, they, they sold out for $40 million. Now, yeah. how do they make that much money in four years? And the talent they bring is that they're creatures of Washington. That's a very, very, very valuable commodity. I mean, if you can sell yourself as someone who knows how Washington works, someone who has these relationships, someone who can get on the phone and get the president of the United States to pardon you know, your fugitive client, that's a very, very marketable commodity. I mean, if you, see, if you are seen as someone who knows how this town works, someone who is a usual suspect in this town, you can dine out for years. That's why no one leaves. You once asked the Democrat Jack Quinn what appealed to him about the Republican Ed Gillespie, who became his partner when they first started bonding, and he answered? Well, Ed got the joke. And what's the joke? I, that's what I said. I said, Jack, what's the joke? And he said, the joke is that, well, we're all patriots. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was both, it was some mix of sarcasm, contempt, um, uh, glibness, I don't know. Uh, it, was a, it was a fascinating answer. You report in here that over the last dozen years, corporate America, much of it Wall Street, has tripled, triple the amount of money it spent on lobbying and public affairs in D.C. Because, and I'm quoting you, they have figured out that despite the exorbitant cost of hiring lobbyists, <laughs> the ability to shape or tweak or kill even the tiniest legislative loophole can be worth tens of millions of dollars. First of all, there's extravagant waste in, in the private sector of Washington. If you go to some of these lobbying offices and parties and, and what they're billing people, I mean, it looks like an incredible racket. In fact, these companies are getting what they pay for. I mean, Tony Podesta, who we talked about before, a Democratic lobbyist, talked about how great it is that laws are so complicated now. I mean, it was, it was, the context was, I think it was Dodd-Frank or I might have been in healthcare. It, there are these tiny little loopholes. They go on for thousands of pages. And if you can be a lobbyist or, or a lawyer in a firm who can understand this much and you're getting paid you know, tens of millions of dollars, but you're probably saving your clients you know, hundreds of millions of dollars, sometimes more. So it's very cost effective. I mean, the, the complete arcaneness of, of this world is, again, very, very good for business. Let's quickly run through some of the roll call of influence peddlers that you write about. Billy Tozen. <laughs> Billy Tozen was a former Democrat, became a Republican congressman, um, went on to become the head of the, one of the top pharmaceutical lobbies in the country. After in the House overseeing the drug industry, uh, chairing the committee that oversaw the drug industry, and he was crucial in passing the Medicare prescription bill, which has meant billions uh, in profits for the drug companies. Then he resigned, as you say, uh, ran the pharmaceuticals lobbying arm in Washington, and in 2010, according to you, made $11.6 million. Steve Croft and 60 Minutes did an expose of him. I mean, this doesn't look good. But that, I mean, that, you that's push this bill through that gets a, uh, that produces a windfall for the drug companies, and then a short time later, you go to work for the drug lobby at a salary of $2 million. There's nothing I could have done in my life after leaving Congress that wouldn't have had, I didn't have some impact on in 25 years in Congress. And if that looks bad, do you have at it? That's the truth. In fairness to Billy Tozan and former Medicare Chief Tom Scully, they weren't the only public officials involved with the prescription drug bill who later went to work for the pharmaceutical industry. Just before the vote, Tozan cited the people who had been most helpful in getting it passed. And I specifically want to thank the staffs of our committees from Ways and Means, John McManus, who did such a great job. Within a few months, McManus left Congress and started his own lobbying firm. Among his new clients were Pharma, Pfizer, Lilly, and Merck. From the majority side of the Finance Committee, Linda Fishman. Fishman left to become a lobbyist with the drug manufacturer Amgen. Not the least of all, but the Energy and Commerce Committee staff who toiled so hard for us. Chief of Staff Pat Morrissey. Morrissey took a job lobbying for drug Thank companies Novartis and Hoffman LaRoche. And Jeremy Allen. He went to Johnson & Johnson. Uh, Kathleen Weldon and Jim Barnett. She went to lobby for Biogen, a biotech company. He left the lobby for Hoffman LaRoche. They did a marvelous job for this house, and we owe them a debt of thanks. Thank you all. We owe them all right. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it happens, uh, it happens with every bill. I mean, I think what was striking about that is Congressman Tozan actually sort of 
basically sent a resume out on all of their behalf by sort of doing a roll call in his his remarks. But look, I mean, uh, the Steve Croft piece, Croft piece was 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 stunning in that I, I think he caught Tozan just I, not oddly flat-footed. I mean, I think, but we, we seemed I sort of in reading his face, he seemed almost flat-footed that the question would be asked. I mean, no one is is really going to burn any bridges. I mean, it's like one big bridge in some ways. And look, I mean, I mean, Jack Abramoff is a name that actually has not come up here. I mean, he is, he is the picture of modern disgrace in Washington, right? The disgraced lobbyist. Um, one of the many books I read in preparing this book was, was his memoir, which he wrote, I think, largely, I don't know if he wrote it in prison, but I think a lot of it was probably derived from his, his ruminations in prison. He, he told about how he knew as a lobbyist he would have these relationships with people on the Hill, people in the White House, people, elected officials, and at a certain point they would say, hey, you know what, Congressman X, or you know what, Staffer X, you're really good at this. When, when, we're, when you're done, have you thought about what you're going to do when you leave the Hill? And they'd say, well, not really. Or they would just sort of leave the question open. And Jack Abramoff said, I knew that when I could ask that question, I owned him. Because there's a, there's a preemptive bribe there. It's, you know, you're going to be making maybe a million dollars at my lobbying firm if you answer this question correctly and you act correctly, I mean, in your office, if you can help us, if you can maintain this friendship for as long as you are in power. I mean, when you see Peter Orzag going to Citigroup, when you see Jake Seward going to Goldman, when you see Jeff Morrell going to BP, it does sort of beg the question, who were they working for when they were at the Pentagon, at the OMB, at the Treasury Department? I mean, you just sort of wonder where their mind is. Trent Lott, you say he's the archetype of the age of the former. Right. What's a former? A former is a former office holder, a former senator, a former congressman, a former White House deputy chief of staff or whatever. Um, I mean, the line I have in the book is that formers stick to Washington like melted cheese on a gold-plated toaster. They don't go home anymore. They talk about how much they hate Washington, but they settle in here uh, quite comfortably. And Trent Lott was the Senate Majority Leader, uh, you know, very powerful Republican. He kind of abruptly retired in 2007, I think, went into business with John Bro, a Democratic senator. He was a longtime senator from Louisiana. As a member of Congress, Bro said, someone called him a cheap whore, and he said, I'm not that cheap. And he also said, my vote cannot be bought, it can be rented. Um, Trent so you've Law, got the Republican lot and the Democratic road it's another creating a boutique, a boutique lobby firm? firm. Yeah, although they, they eventually were absorbed into um, Patton Boggs, which is you know, one of the bigger lobbying firms. In Tommy Florida. Boggs, son of the former Democratic majority leader, Hale yeah. Boggs, who's exactly. arguably the most powerful lobbyist in, firm in Washington. Has been for, for many, many yeah. years. But anyway, so Trent Lott and, um, and John Bro have been very, very successful in the last five, six years as, as lobbyists. Trent Lott... Um, a pretty candid guy. I mean, he talked about how much he hates Washington. I said, so why do you stay? He, and he looked at me like I was crazy. And he said, well, because this is where all the problems are, but this is where all the money is. I mean, this is what keeps people here. And, and it's true. No one leaves anymore. Richard Gephardt. Richard Gephardt, uh, former House Majority Leader, two-time presidential candidate, a hero to organize labor. Son of a teamster. Son of a teamster. Milk truck driver. Um, gave some of the most impassioned campaign rallies I've ever seen in places like Iowa and... You know, or worked Iowa. for working people. For working people. I mean, he, 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 he seemed like the real deal. Uh, he became a lobbyist, like a lot of members of Congress do, and he since um, has worked for a lot of corporations. Goldman Sachs, Boeing, Visa, I get from your book. Yeah, many of them not terribly friendly to organized labor. In Congress, as you say, he fought for labor, but then he went to work for Sp Spirit Aerosystems, overseeing a tough anti-union campaign. And then in the House, he had supported a resolution condemning the Armenian genocide of 1915. When he left Congress, he was paid about $70,000 a month by the Turkish government to oppose the resolution. Yeah, I mean, I guess the word genocide uh, goes down a little easier at those rates, right? I mean, it's, um, look, I mean, I don't, I don't see any shame there. I, I don't, again, he's allowed to change his mind for money, uh, I'm allowed to be outraged. Evan Bayh, Democrat from Indiana. Yeah, Evan, Evan Bayh was this you know, two-term senator. He retired very, very extravagantly in the pages of the New York Times about how Washington is broken, how he was 
tired of all the yell yelling matches and partisanship and, and how nothing gets done, and he wanted to get into an honorable line of work. And a lot of his colleagues were not happy with this description, but also were rolling his eyes because they were like, where, where was that outrage when you were in office? And one of his colleagues said, well, that's the most effective speech he's given you know, in, in eight years here or in 12 years here. Uh, he immediately joined Fox News. He joined the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, this is someone who was a runner-up to be President Obama's running mate. Um, he and Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff under President Bush, they sort of did a dog and pony act in which they would go out in the country on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. And, which is uh, the biggest business lobby Biggest business in lobby in Washington, in Washington. absolutely. A, a big thorn in the side of this White House. And have, you know, been giving a lot of speeches sort of uh, in support of, of that agenda. In your book, you quote one journalist calling by the perfectly representative face for the rotted Washington establishment. Another of your colleagues said he was acting to entrench the culture of narcissism and hypocrisy that's killing the United States Congress. Another describes him practically a caricature of what a sellout looks like. I would take from your book that you don't think those depictions are too harsh. No, not at all. I, I think it's true. Look, I mean, I just sort of lay out the examples. I lay out his words. I mean, he, again, he was so sanctimonious in his departure. Can we not remember that we are one nation under God with a common heritage and a common destiny? Let us no longer be divided into red states and blue states, but reunite once more as 50 red, white, and blue states. As the civil rights leader once reminded us, we may have arrived on these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. So my friends, the time has come for the sons and daughters of Lincoln and the heirs of Jefferson and Jackson to no longer wage war upon each other, but instead to renew the struggles against the ancient enemies of man, ignorance, poverty, and disease. That is why we're here. That is why. He was, so, he, he was so disgusted with Washington, and of course he stayed, and, and there are all these examples of, of what he has gone on to do. So, look, it all speaks for itself. I mean, you, you can, it's nice that there are commentators who can put a, fine, a, point, a finer point on it, but this is all out there. Chris Dodd, former Peace Corps volunteer. Chris Dodd, very nice guy, very fun, loving guy. I mean, very sort of you know, outspoken liberal. He, was, he had this great legislative last hurrah. Um, in 2010, where he, you know, he authored Dodd, co-authored Dodd Frank. Uh, he was one of the chief engineers of the health care bill. I remember talking to him when he announced he wasn't going to run. He, he got into some trouble. Uh, he was very, very unpopular and back in Connecticut. Uh, he got in some trouble with a mortgage uh, broker. He took a, a loan, I think, from Countrywide, Countrywide. which was a force in the, in the housing in the house, bubble. Right, at a time when he was, you know, presumably, you know, was chairman of the banking committee, could have been very involved in that, but also was running for president in a fairly quixotic. With a lot and, of money from uh, Wall Street. A lot of money from Wall Street, um, you know, and he basically decamped to Iowa for a few months in 2008. Uh, Chris Dodd, I remember having lunch with him in, in the Senate dining room and saying, so what are you going to do now? And it was... He was, it was a triumphant moment, and he, I mean, because these bills were actually going to pass. And he said, oh, boy, the possibilities are endless. I mean, I could be a college president. I might go out to work, out, work for some startup. I might rejoin the Peace Corps. I mean, he had this look of possibility, and I said, well, you're not going to lobby, right? And he said, oh, no, no, no. I'll take that off the table right, right now. And he is now head of one of the most powerful lobbies in town, the Motion Pictures Association of America. Um, you know, he would say that, well, I'm not registered to lobby technically, and it's true, but he also oversees a staff of lobbyists. And uh, the, the, the chapter about that is, I talk about just the institutionalization of being part of the political class. I mean, Do you think it, he lied to you? He would say that his thinking evolved. He would say, I don't think he, I, I, I don't know, what do you call it? It turned out not to be true. I mean, he, um, look, it's disappointing. I mean, I just say that as someone who is looking for, for someone to level with him. You say official language in Washington is fraudulent language. It's the language of spin, yeah. marketing, PR. It's not how human beings talk to each other. And people don't recognize, you, you become very anesthetized. I mean, Washington yeah. is a huge, huge dome of anesthesia. Um, people don't fully know just, again, the BS that, that is just part of the day-to-day -day transaction. And again, it, it's hard to realize when you're living there. I mean, I think 
Bob Bennett, the senator from um, from Utah, he was voted out. Well, Mike Lee primaried lost him. Tea Party. Tea Party yeah. guy. Someone says, so you're going to, to cash in? He goes, I'm entitled to make a living. And that's, look, it's what they do. You write about Anita Dunn. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Anita Dunn. Anita Dunn was a longtime Democratic operative. She was one of the top aides for President Obama's 08 campaign. She was a communications director for a time in the White House. Very, very sharp woman. As you say, Anita Dunn helped Michelle Obama set up her Let's Move program to stop obesity. I'm almost quoting you verbatim. Yep, yeah, sure. Then she signs on as a consultant to the food manufacturing and media firms trying to block restrictions on sugary foods targeting children. Her husband, by the way, and this is coincidental, I'm sure, mm -hmm. happened to be the president's White House counsel. Certainly Anita Dunn has benefited greatly from the perception of her being still a a figure with ties to the White House, whether it's her husband, who's now the former White House counsel, but, but someone who has all kinds of friends there, who's on the phone there all the time. I mean, that has to be a boon to her corporate clients. You talked about President Obama and his campaign and his opposition to the revolving door. Let me play you uh, a, an excerpt from one of his speeches. But the American people deserve more than simply an assurance that those who are coming to Washington will serve their interests. They also deserve to know that there are rules on the books to keep it that way. They deserve a government that is truly of, by, and for the people. As I often said during the campaign, we need to make the White House the people's house. And we need to close the revolving door that lets lobbyists come into government freely and lets them use their time in public service as a way to promote their own interests over the interests of the American people when they leave. And what happened? They have put this law in place. We won't have lobbyists in the White House. They kept making exceptions. They, there have been a number of people who they have waived that rule for. But ultimately, I think what's happened is more on the other end. You've had people leaving the White House to go right to K Street. You've had people leaving the White House going right to Goldman Sachs, going right to BP, going right to uh, Citigroup. I mean, some of the biggest corporate nemeses of this administration in the first term are now being staffed at the highest levels by people who we're staffing the Obama administration at the Peter Rozag, who was Obama's uh, head OMD of director, Office of Management and Budget director. Now at City. High level at City. Um, Jake Seward, who was a chief counselor to Tim Geithner, as Secretary of uh, Treasury. They were doing all kinds of battle with Goldman Sachs during the first term, especially after the financial crisis. Jake is now the head of communications for Goldman Sachs. I mean, and, and so many of them have a connection to someone else who figures prominent in your book, Robert Rubin, yeah. Clinton's Treasury Good. Secretary. I mean, there's always been a, a symbiosis between Wall Street and Washington to some degree, but I think the Clinton era in, introduced a whole new level of magnitude to this. And, and Bob Rubin, who was the sort of storied um, head of Goldman Sachs for many, many years, coming to take the, the reins at Treasury was really, I mean, he was a real guru and he brought a lot of protégés, Larry Summers being a, the biggest example, to town, Tim Geithner being another one. And um, yeah, and then you know the, the the economy crashes, the banks crash. I mean, Robert Rubin gets a great deal of blame. I mean, Bill Clinton himself did a mea culpa on Robert on Robert Rubin on ABC News on ABC News on George Stephanopoulos. Uh, Rubin had been a force in uh, in in killing Glass Steagall, which was the firewall yes. between commercial banks and investment, and investment banks. banks. And he was a big supporter of derivatives, deregulation, absolutely, and all that contributed to the fiscal crisis. After he left the Treasury Department, he went to City. Went back to City. You say he made $126 million in he nine did. years? He did. No, he did very, very, very well. You call Rubin the primest of movers in the modern marriage of politics and wealth creation. He was the ambassador to the Clinton wealth machine. I mean, even, I mean, you had people like Rahm Emanuel, who was a, a mid-level White House you know, operative in the Clinton White House, who uh, was able to go, out, go to uh, Wasserstein Perella and make, you know, 16 point Two or 16 point something million. 18 million dollars, 18 million dollars in okay. two years. In two years, and then before he went back to become a public servant again and run for Congress. But no, Bob Rubin brought this whole generation of Wall Street people to Washington, then he brought them back from Washington to Wall Street, greatly enriched. And, and look, he's a hero to a lot of people on Wall Street. He was a hero to a lot of people in Washington. And, and again, I think Bill Clinton, more than anyone in the last you know, few decades, has sort of engineered this. this this relationship. When we come back, Mark Leibovich and I will talk about how the Washington Press Corps has been seduced by the power game. But first, this is pledge time on public television. We're taking a short break so you can show your support for the programming you see right here on this station.
For those of you still with us, for all its greed and power madness, Washington's still a place where citizens can go and make a noise. Here's a story from earlier this year about a group of restaurant workers who barely survive on minimal salaries and customer tips. They marched on Capitol Hill for a fair wage and a square deal. For the past 22 years, these workers have been stuck at a federal minimum wage of $2.13 an hour. At the head of the march, Saru Jayaraman. The organization she co-founded, Restaurant Opportunity Centers United, is fighting to improve wages and working conditions for the people who cook and serve the food we eat at restaurants and then clean up when we're done. Saru Jaya Rahman's new book, Behind the Kitchen Door, is an insider's expose of what it's really like to work at the lowest rungs of the restaurant industry. There are actually now over 10 million restaurant workers in the United States. Seven of the ten lowest paying jobs in America are restaurant jobs, and the two absolute lowest paying jobs in America are restaurant. Dishwashers and fast food preps and cooks are the two absolute lowest paying jobs in America. These workers earn poverty wages because the minimum wage for tipped workers at the federal level has been frozen for 22 years at $2.13 an hour. And it's the reason that food servers use food stamps at double the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce and have a poverty rate of three times the rest of the U.S. workforce. We got to this place because of the power of the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. They've been named the 10th most powerful lobbying group in Congress. And back in 1996, when Herman Cain was the head of the National Restaurant Association, he struck a deal with Congress saying that we will not oppose the overall minimum wage continuing to rise as long as the minimum wage for tipped workers stays frozen forever. And so it has for the last 22 years. Imagine your average server in an IHOP in Texas earning $2.13 an hour, graveyard shift, no tips. The company's supposed to make up the difference between $2.13 and $7.25, but time and time again, that doesn't happen. And when a slow night happens and you don't earn anything or very little in tips, you often can't pay the rent. And I guarantee you, in every restaurant in America, there's at least one person who's on the verge of homelessness or being evicted or going through some uh, kind of instability. It's an incredible irony that the people who put food on our tables use food stamps at twice the rate of the rest of the U.S. workforce, meaning that the people who put food on our tables can't afford to put food on their own families' tables. The other key issue that we find workers face is the lack of paid sick days and health care benefits. Two-thirds of all workers report cooking, preparing, and serving food when they're ill with the flu or other sicknesses. And with a wage as little as $2.13, so reliant on tips for their wages, these workers simply cannot afford to take a day off when sick, let alone let risk losing their jobs. The majority of workers are adults. Many are parents and single parents, single mothers, um, using the restaurant job as their main source of income. We partner with more than a hundred small business owners around the country who are doing the right thing, providing good, decent wages, better working conditions, paid sick days, benefits, opportunities for advancement. So I think that's the first thing I would say to a small business owner is, look, there are tons of people who are already doing it. We're here to help you. They're here to help you try this new way of doing business. Acting on that democratic impulse, Saru Jayaraman and the protesting workers march from Capitol Hill to the Capitol Grill Steakhouse, owned by one of the biggest restaurant chains in America. 86,000 customers of yours have signed a petition calling on you to pay a minimum of at least $5 an hour to your workers. Because $2.13 is just not enough to live on. So here you go. Thank you. Thank you. We now continue with Moyers and Company. Let's get to the press. You write, never before has the so-called permanent establishment of Washington included so many people in the media. And you write, Washington puts the me in media. How so? 
Look, I mean, first of all, just the rise in new media has given everyone a voice. I mean, the rise of cable has given everyone a face. I mean, it has never been easier to become a media celebrity. And I think punditry has replaced reporting as the gold standard of, of my profession. I mean, the, the media is everywhere in Washington. I mean, I think the White House Correspondents' Dinner is a classic example of how Washington, you know, rewards being famous, being on TV, being your, a brand more than anything. Your descriptions of the White House Correspondents Association dinner, the annual dinner, are fabulous in the book. The dinner is to sold out every table since 1993 at $2,500 a pop. Yeah, but I mean, even the greater outrage is that there's, there, it now goes over five days. You have probably about two dozen pre-parties and after parties. You probably have tens of millions of dollars, some funded by corporations in entertainment, in, in sort of people sucking up to everyone else, and in, in food and musical acts and so forth. Uh, because, of course, you know, a single banquet is no longer sufficient to celebrate the accomplishments of the Washington media. Um, Tom Brokaw, who has become a, a real activist against the White House Correspondents' Dinner, um, said that it, it sends the message that it's all about the people on the screen. It's all about the media, which I think to some degree is true. I mean, the media is feeling great about itself. The media is as rich as any other part of the economy. And, um, and I think the, the Correspondents' Dinner is a classic example of this. Have you attended one? Uh, I have, although um, not since 1996, because the New York Times stopped letting us go. Why? Um, they thought it was to Dean Beck Hay, who's now the managing editor of the Times, he was the Washington bureau chief of the Times, I think it was in 2007 actually, declared that this was too cozy. He didn't like the message it sent. Uh, he would prefer that we stop going. I thought it was a great decision. Describe the dinner to me. It's just this room full of tuxedoed people. A lot of Hollywood celebrities come in. A lot of people talk about you know, the good that, that the press does. But again, it's an extravaganza that continues, that it becomes the ultimate bubble world, the ultimate example of decadence in Washington that people know intuitive, intuitively is wrong, but have no either will or ability to stop. This is a big night in Washington. Anyone who's anybody is here, and it, the key question for anyone in Washington is what are you wearing? So you've got the politicians, the journalists, and plenty of celebrities thrown in between. I had a Katy Perry sighting, saw Bradley Cooper, too. Is there anyone you're excited to meet tonight? Um, everyone, actually. Um, you know, I just came in with my buddy Chris Tucker. It was good to see him. Do you understand that uh, you know Michael Steele? Michael Steele? Yeah. Yeah. Do I? Do you? Who is Michael Steele? And who are you wearing tonight? Badgley Mishka. <laughs> So you're asking people what they're wearing and all that? Well, what, what are you wearing? <laughs> it's like today, any political conversations you're going to have at all? Sure, we have, we're having one right now, aren't we? Yeah. Is this still not the craziest thing ever? Well, when so did this get to be like this? Thank you, everybody. How do you like my new entrance music? <laughs> the problem is excess to some degree. It is perfectly emblematic of the reality distortion field inside of Washington, of, of just having no sense whatsoever. And what I think is sort of striking is th this year, uh, Kevin Spacey, um, who's the star of House of Cards, which is not a very flattering picture of Washington, and Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who is uh, the star of Veep, which is this very, very funny HBO show. Uh, neither about, of, the vice uh, about the vice presidency, neither of which paint Washington in a flattering light. They both showed up to the dinner. They went to the big after party sponsored by Vanity Fair and Bloomberg, and they were both swarmed. Everyone was like, oh, we have to get our picture taken with Kevin Spacey and, and with uh, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who, I mean, ultimately paint a, a, a hideous portrait of how Washington works, and, and, and Washington is its most grotesque and perverse, and yet that's what we're celebrating. And, and again, it, you do sort of pinch yourself after a while and say, what are we celebrating here? Yeah, there's a sequence in Netflix's House of Cards where some of Washington's best known journalists are playing themselves in a fantasy world. Just before we came on the air, I received an advanced copy of an article that's going to be in tomorrow's Washington Herald's front page. And it was written by Zoe Barnes. And in it, she quotes an editorial that ran in the Williams College Register when you were editor back in September 1978, which called the Israeli presence in the Gaza Strip and West Bank, quote, an illegal occupation. Quoting a source close to the president as saying that Senator Catherine Durant will likely be the new nominee for Secretary of State after Michael Curran's withdrawal 
Congressman Frank Underwood says he got, quote, schooled by AFT spokesman and chief strategist Martin Spinella during a debate last night on this network. In the past 24 hours, reruns of The Gaff have played nonstop on TV news programs and the Internet. Does it say something to you that prominent journalists are willing to erase the line between reality and fiction? If you look at something like House of Cards, if you look at something like The Correspondents' Dinner, where you have Hollywood and Washington merging, and you have kind of a joined mind, a joined fame machine, you realize that the lines might not be that drawn to begin with in any mind. I mean, I think one of the things, there's a scene at the end of this book in which a member of the campaign team from 2012 for President Obama said, after a while, it just seemed like everyone was thinking about who was going to play them in the next version of Game Change. This is Sarah. Which is this campaign book that, that was written by Mark Halpern and John Heilman about the 2008 campaign bestseller. And, and again, that sort of goes to the larger cinematic sense that people have of themselves here. There's a sense of preening, a sense of, who's going to play me in the movie? Um, will I get a cameo playing myself in the movie, as people in the Game Change movie did? That's another scene in here. And again, it's a sort of blame, it, it's the sort of blurring of the larger class of fame, of, of really the ruling class in the public perception game, mm. that I, I think is, is as much a part of this decadence as, as really anything else. I was surprised when I read the book because I had followed your reporting and you were reporting good stories, anecdotal stories, and fact-driven stories, but they didn't seem to have the narrative's arc yeah. that emerges in this. Was that something you came to in the course of writing it or in the course of reporting? How did that come about? It became a moment, and it, and it did occur to me in, in being exposed to this that the political class that I'm writing about has reached some kind of critical mass in the 21st century. I, I think there's something going on in Washington that needed to be called out. But the moment I you do, talk about it. The moment I talk about it, I, again, I don't think it can be sustained, and I think it's indecent. I think it is not how Americans want their government and their capital city to be. Um, I, I think in some ways, and I always sort of cower under this, this claim when people ask me for prescriptions, but I think in some ways, I mean, I'm holding a mirror to a culture. Um, it is a culture that people only know around the edges. Um, I wanted to take it sort of full on in all its components, including the media, and, and hope to paint a picture that will stand as something that is lasting for this era. Is it conceivable to you that one, two, three, or four more people in your book might say, wait a minute, this is shameful. And, and, and they can't change it out there because we are impenetrable. So I'm going to stand up and we're going to change it from within. Look, I mean, there are a lot of good people in Washington. I mean, it sounds contradictory given a lot of what we've talked about. But, but there are people who, a lot of people who, especially when they're young or when they were young, they came from a place of decency. They came from a place of hope. Um, and that doesn't completely go away, right? So, um, look, I, I wrote a book. <clears throat> and I'm speaking as a journalist, who, that I think in probably some level was a product of disgust, my own disgust. Um, maybe even there was a level of, of unconscious desire to check myself before finding myself too deep in the club, too much a part of this world. And I mean, so look, I mean, I, I absolutely love, would love this book to be <clears throat> a source of, of shame, of self-reflection, but I think I'm willing to start with discomfort. If this is a source of discomfort, I'm very happy with that too. Suppose this culture in Washington is more representative of the country today than you want to acknowledge. Mm -hmm. What if Washington has become the Wall Street way, the Las Vegas way, the Silicon Valley way? It, it, it's a classic chicken egg question. What we have now in the population is a level of dissonance, right? It's a level of disgust that is, that is parallel to, um, you know, maybe some indifference, but, but that is also parallel to your own role in reelecting your congressman, your own role 
in watching these shouting matches on cable, your own role in perpetuating this system, in, in, being, in being transfixed by these ads. So, yes, I mean, I think that this dissonance is something that, that lives in a very, very distilled way inside our nation's capital. And I think it's acted out by these, by these real life players who are in a very writ large way experiencing both the American dream and the American nightmare. And that is something that I think makes this town, but also the nation's capital at this moment, a very, very palpable place to watch this disconnect play out. And again, it's a lot to get your head around. I, I do think it is worth a discussion, and frankly, a smarter discussion than many people in Washington are willing to have. This town is the place to begin. Uh, Mark Leibovich, thank you very much for the book, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Bill. That's it for this week. I'm Bill Moyers. See you next time. Funding is provided by Carnegie Corporation of New York, celebrating 100 years of philanthropy and committed to doing real and permanent good in the world. The Kohlberg Foundation, independent production fund with support from the Partridge Foundation, a John and Polly Guth charitable fund. The Clements Foundation, Park Foundation, dedicated to heightening public awareness of critical issues. The Herb Alpert Foundation, supporting organizations whose mission is to promote compassion and creativity in our society. The Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Foundation. The John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, committed to building a more just, verdant, and peaceful world. More information at macfound.org. Ann Gumowitz. The Betsy and Jesse Fink Foundation. The HKH Foundation. Barbara G. Fleischman and by our sole corporate sponsor, Mutual of America, designing customized individual and group retirement products. That's why we're your retirement company.